Big thanks to my friends at NVIDIA for sponsoring today's video. Well, I've been sitting on this one for a while. The quadfecta of extremes my rankings are based on are the best, worst, easiest, and hardest of a particular topic. I can't say that defining the biggest doormats of a 10 year time span would be all that exhilarating, but the pinnacle of difficulty is a hot topic in the get good era. Though the decade list fad may have come and gone, I found myself wanting to reflect on anything other than 2020 for a while. I can't imagine why. Masochism is an alluring mistress, so naturally my idea of a mental vacation is to relive the 10 biggest boss beatdowns I received in the last decade. Only rules being one boss per series and no remakes. Keep in mind this list is based solely on my own experience, so it will likely differ dramatically from your own. Without further ado, here are the top 10 hardest bosses of the 2010s. Number 10, Fume Knight Dark Souls 2. Rames come a long way on this channel. Originally shafted out of my top 10 hardest bosses in the Souls series back in 2016 to the dismay of thousands of people, to making my remastered list as the hardest Souls boss other than Flame Lurker, to now being the sole representative of Souls on this list. If you've seen that video and want my justifications for Fume Knight over Flame Lurker now, it boils down to what it would be like to fight them right now. If I decided to boot up Demon Souls tomorrow because the remake thirst is getting too real, I know exactly how to beat Flame Lurker. Pick royalty and run away like a magical spice addict snorting my way to Soul Arrow spam. Or get the relatively easy to access Crescent Falchion or Bless Mace. Or save him until you do other worlds and get beefy stats. While Flame Lurker can drop the boom on you well enough to cause problems no matter your strategy, there are at least viable ways to diminish his challenge if you're experienced. No matter how many times you make the plunge to the depths of Old Iron King's non lava hole, the Ashen Warrior awaiting you there will always pose a significant challenge. His in game DLC status means high levels, powerful builds, and game knowledge will only get you so far. Fume Knight's dual wield variations start a snowball of odds against the player. You've got to be on a consistent lookout for quick strikes with the skewer and still pretty fast attacks with the Omega Burn Blade. What the latter lacks in blistering speed, it makes up for with hitbox girth. That thick greatsword has a knack for taking advantage of your lack of instability frames, in other words, the time you're safe while rolling. This is exacerbated by the adaptability stack giving you less base iframes than the other games. Even if you know to level to 2680p to hit the same amount of roll invincibility as the original, you still have to deal with DS2's spotty hit detection. And this is all for a single dodge. The difficulty spikes dramatically when you consider how quickly he combos attacks together. If every dodge has a higher probability than usual to fail, this becomes more problematic the longer the fight lasts. And it can go on for quite a while when you consider his high health, massive damage that necessitates healing, small downtime between attacks to allow for that healing, and phase 2 that has even harder to dodge attacks. This leads to a lot of deaths, especially for new players, which takes advantage of the health penalty stacking up, making each attempt harder without a wealth of effigies. Put simply, I think the margin for error in this fight is higher than anything else the series has to offer. Bless the uncharacteristically short runback, because you'll be liable to make quite a few laps in an out of range Thunderdome. Number 9, Grim Matchstick, Cuphead. We all know Cuphead is one of the hardest games ever made, so it was naturally a lock for a list celebrating monumental challenges. Though the tutorial was in heavy consideration, as was Dr. Call's infernal robot, this bumbling blowhard still gives me headaches to this day. The first phase isn't so bad. Though the fireballs, tracking beams, and tail stabs take up a decent amount of space on the already stuffed screen due to the giant lizard taking up a quarter of it, there is a solid amount of space to work with. My only gripe that adds to the difficulty is how the clouds can blend into the background colors and real time. The animation is gorgeous, don't get me wrong, but I have a habit of keeping my eyes on the boss and not my own positioning. This leads to the cloud colors getting washed out in my peripheral vision. This only grows more troublesome in the second phase when your space to maneuver is further limited by the fireball march restricting the bottom quarter. You have to keep focus on damage to end the fight in a reasonable time, keep shifting clouds, and predict the movements of the little embers. But none of this holds a candle to the third phase. The triple header reaches its climax with a relentless assault of fireballs arced in your direction. The screen space feels more limited than ever, the aforementioned fireballs explode in a plus pattern if you shoot them making it even more limited, and there's a horizontal fire blast every few seconds that cuts your evasion options temporarily in half. The busy assault is dizzying as you desperately try to find footing low enough in the clouds for your shots to register on the boss's hitbox. Lobber shots make a world of difference to be sure, but the three strikes you're out system feels oppressive in a game where getting hit is so easy. That could be said for a handful of Cuphead's fights, but Grim Matchstick's personal brand of offense and arena design paints one of the most difficult pictures of the decade for me. Number 8, Virgil Devil May Cry 5. 
Shout out to Ryosuke Yoshida, combat designer on Devil May Cry 5. The honor is all mine, my friend. As for Virgil, he isn't merely the quality go to the decade, but a difficulty juggernaut as well. In fact, if you crank up the game to Dante Must Die and beyond, you could make an argument for Virgil earning top honors. Judging him in a more balanced manner toward all difficulties and my own experience on Devil Hunter and Son of Sparta, he's still quite tough, just not top 5 of the decade tough. A large portion of my love for Virgil comes from the excellent balance in his design, but also how tight those mechanics make him the perfect playground for the wide array of tools you have at your disposal. Devil May Cry 5 has one of the best combat systems of all time. The graded combo system blended into this hack and slash environment plays perfectly off Dante's huge arsenal and Nero's devil breaker and aerial abilities. Virgil tests your mastery of these systems. Beating him in and of itself is a feat with his usage of devil trigger, counters, insane damage, lightning speed, and combo strings that can spell instant death on a single mistake, let alone being able to do it in smoking sexy style. Despite my reruns of the game and progress toward ANS ranks throughout Son of Sparta, Virgil is the wall I still struggle to overcome. It's a fantastic challenge to face, but an immense one nonetheless. Number 7, Orphan of Cost, Bloodborne. My struggles with the shrimp are well documented across the channel, so I'll be brief. Out of every single modern FromSoft game, this is one of only two bosses that still manages to strike a sense of dread in me. Not the, for the love of Gwyn, this is gonna be painful sort of dread that the Beta Chaos inspires. No, it's more of a stomach dropping fear of the imminent obliteration I'm about to endure. I know every single one of his attacks by heart, but that won't stop his absurd damage output, especially with the presence of counter damage, how unpredictable his mix ups are, particularly in the second phase, and if any Thing, my veteran confidence makes me take bold risks and end in my demise more often than his. I've generally gotten pretty great at the first half. In fact, if the entire fight was that, he wouldn't even make the list. It's that cost forsaken, erratic, shrimp slamming second phase that continues to give me the business no matter how much I practice. The range he can cover in both movement and attacks is unreal. My goal in every fight is to loop his AI as much as possible to maximize damage in phase one to make this portion as short as can be. The only reason Orphan misses the top five is how viable that is, but make no mistake, I am no better at dealing with his final form than I was on day one. Number 6, Demon of Hatred, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. Despite my references to the all-time Souls boss videos of old, I've yet to rehash this debate with Sekiro in the mix. That makes this a fine opportunity to pass a difficulty torch to this embodiment of hatred, an emotion this monster regularly inspires in the players that face it. It's been said by many including myself, and I stand by the complaint that the Demon of Hatred is a Sekiro boss that plays by Dark Souls rules. While it certainly is possible to deflect many of its attacks, it feels much more consistent to dodge and jump out of the way. Souls habits that Sekiro spends its entire higher runtime beating out of you. At a time when most players are reaching mastery of the deflect system, introducing a boss better dodged is a devilish mix-up that throws nearly everyone for a loop. That combat system is polished to a brilliant shine, and though I love it, the narrow scope makes Sekiro's difficulty curve lean toward becoming easier faster than any other FromSoft game. Though timings vary from enemy to enemy, once you become adept and patient with deflecting enemy assaults, replaying most battles becomes dramatically easier. The only boss I've consistently struggled with in Sekiro is the demon that defies that curve in every way, shape, and form. Giant attacks that are difficult to dodge, let alone deflect, variable combo structure, brutal endgame damage, and absurd health pool relative to any other boss, tricky unblockable charges that require jumping when the battle trains you to reflexively dodge, among many other attacks that are tough to deal with consistently over such a long battle. The only thing saving him from top 5 honors is the malcontent whistle prosthetic that can stun him. It's notable, but not enough to stop him from earning my nod as the hardest from soft boss of the decade. But if your PC's hardest boss is keeping up with modern demands, NVIDIA's GeForce Now's GPU in the cloud is your path to graphical bliss. GeForce Now transforms your PC, Shield TV, Android device, even a Mac, yes, a Mac, into a graphical monster that can play thousands of games sourced from your own digital libraries. For those of you with aging rigs, this means you can get access to decade-defining games like The Witcher 3 in their full graphical glory. Just add the game to your library and install it through the GeForce Now app, then boom, 2020 high-end graphics. GeForce Now has a free plan with standard servers and one-hour play sessions, and a founder's plan with priority server access and six-hour long sessions. Check out the link in the description below to sign up for GeForce Now at a special discounted rate. Thanks to NVIDIA for sponsoring today's video, and thank you for listening.
Number 5 Vermivorous the Invincible Borderlands 2 While this channel often focuses on bosses and melee centric games, I enjoy the odd shooter every now and again, especially when they have a unique hook. Borderlands has loads of those draws including its raid bosses. What makes Vermivorous uniquely qualified for this list other than the obvious features of being a rough endgame boss challenge is the ridiculous requirements to fight him. Unlike most of Borderlands raid bosses, Vermivorous is a unique world spawn. Varkids, a pesky bug enemy archetype, has an evolution system. After a certain amount of time, as long as they're engaged in combat, they have a chance of evolving into a tougher model. These odds are impacted by three factors. How many players are in your world, how many playthroughs you've completed, and sheer dumb luck. You need these little buggers to evolve four times. Without giving you a boring math lesson, I'll cut right to the chase. With a maximum of four players on the highest playthrough level, you have a 1.68% chance that a single Varkid will turn into Vermivorous. That's 1 in 60 Varkid. That does not mean it takes 60 Varkid to get him to spawn. That means every single one you meet has a 1 in 60 chance of being Vermivorous. You will spend far more time playing Varkid Wrangler than you will fighting it. That's difficult in its own right in terms of perseverance through tedium, managing declining ammo, yada yada, then you realize facing him can be an utter nightmare without the right gear. Like most raid bosses, he can annihilate the unprepared. Those who are prepared likely won't have an impossible time, but it's not difficult for it to wipe your team amongst the chaos of all the failed evolutions you'll likely have hassling you. And if you let it out of your line of sight, it has a high chance to despawn. Sometimes it'll even bug out and despawn anyway. Imagine all that hard work lost to a single defeat and having to play the odds again. It's a unique reason, sure, but like some of the bosses to come, it's entirely probable you'll spend hours trying to defeat Vermivorous a single time. An unorthodox choice to be sure, but one I feel is deserving of his spot in the top five. Number four, Blade Bear and Cannoneer Code Vein. This is Ornstein and Smo on Hyper Steroids. You have two choices. Bring the AI ally that Code Vein offers for a little reprieve, at the cost of it likely being melted in the first few minutes, leaving you with higher HP bosses to fight solo. Or go it alone from the very start and deal with every bit of their intense focus. The concept is sound in theory. You have a squishier, fast melee attacker and a slow ranged assaulter. Where it falls apart in practice is twofold. First, they thought it was wise to give Cannoneer an attack that spawns directly underneath you no matter where you are with minimal windup. This makes the pillars in the arena nearly useless useless for splitting aggro. You'll end up pinning yourself in close quarters with the wickedly quick blade bear, spend loads of stamina dodging, then when you finally get a window, you have fire under your butt ready to blow all your efforts away. With this in mind, the other issue comes into play. Since the pillars are essentially useless solo, the diverted attention from the two bosses means it's difficult to keep your eyes on both attacks at the same time. You have to use sound cues and extremely brief visual cues to deal with them when they're split up. Fighting them in the same line of sight can be done with careful placement, but battling them while they're both within melee range is a death sentence. The range of attacks they can dish out is extremely versatile, the pressure exerted is constant, the margin for error is razor thin, and frankly, this whole discussion is giving me horrifying flash Flashbacks of the four to five hours I spent here to swing out a single solo victory. I know we're talking about 10 years worth of bosses, but let me make it abundantly clear just how high the difficulty of these final contenders is. Number 3 Sigrun, Queen of the Valkyries, God of War. Take everything I just talked about, the pressure, the minimal downtime, diverse move pool, high damage output, tiny margin for error, and you get the immense difficulty that is Sigrun. The individual Valkyries aren't so bad once you get the hang of their rhythms. With each only holding one unique attack, your progressive rampage through their ranks becomes easier and easier. That is until you reach their queen, a tyrant that holds their entire bag of tricks and dishes it out in a battle far more intense than I can manage to deal with for hours on end. It genuinely took me at least two hours to be able to consistently get past the minute mark in a battle that took multiple to finish. No single move is problematic, it's how quickly she switches between them. You need to have a near instinctual reaction to them, a reflex that can only be developed through getting stomped on for hours upon hours. You might think that the singular focus would give Blade Bear and Cannoneer the edge, but no! She somehow manages to pack their intensity into a singular battle. Then consider that you can do this on varying difficulties. I'm only talking about the normal mode. I can't even imagine doing this on Give Me God of War. It took every fiber of my skill to pull off a single victory against her. Congratulations to any of you mad lads who've given her the business on the highest difficulty. That's a challenge worthy of number one billing that I'll likely never undertake myself. As it stands in normal mode, she earns a very commendable top three nod. Number two, Jean Hayabusa Nia. 
Sigrun packed all the imposing elements of the Omega ONS into a single combatant for hours of punishment. Jean is all of that, but a million times faster. At least it feels like it. A boss with his outrageous speed should never have enough damage to one-shot you, but he does it with multiple moves. Sure, it'll depend on your build, and there are certain attacks and strategies in the game that can exploit him to a minor degree, but his challenge is more than enough to overcome these hurdles. Of any boss on this list, he made me scramble to find some kind of viable build and strategy to win. I spent so much time playing footsie around this rock taking pot shots at him, only to get sliced down the instant I made an error. I wanted to square up and fight him for the thrill, but unless you have an insane amount of skill in this game, I don't even know if it's possible. It's certainly not for someone of my talents to pull off consistently over the course of battle long enough to win. There are at least some attacks like the fireball that leaves openings for you to buff and debuff him, the rock does provide reprieve for healing, and those aforementioned strategies can be helpful, but it still took me ages to pull off the win. I genuinely almost considered giving up. I never do that for a boss ranking. I just thought I'll make the ending twist to the Neo ranking that he was so hard I couldn't win. But no, I'm too stubborn for that. What's crazy to me is that he holds some of the best gear in the game, so you need to farm him on the New Game Plus cycles to claim that loot. My ordeal came on the standard New Game cycle, and I could barely pull that off. He's challenging enough to nearly claim the number one spot, but in the end, it had to go to the absolute radiance, Hollow Knight. Though I didn't face this maddening moth until I lost my marbles a month ago and decided to defeat the Pantheon of Hollow Nest, ironic considering I have it as an offbeat choice for one of the worst bosses of the decade due to the stubborn lack of flexible checkpoint options, how hard would it have been to make benches being checkpoints a toggleable binding? Would have made it much more accessible, but it's probably fine in its current state. Absolute Radiance in Isolation is well worth a spot on this list. Rather than being a duel, it's more of a massive damage sponge teleporting around an arena full of environmental hazards. Some are worse to deal with than others, but what really makes a challenge shoot through the roof is how unfortunate some can be to deal with in combination. Fireballs are universally painful due to their tracking, but then half of the arena is cut off with spikes. Oh, and a beam is flying around that has to be shade dashed through. Then you're doing it in air on platforms, then it's firing spikes in random directions, then you're ascending up a long climb with seemingly random laser beams shooting down, leading into the final phase that while short offers zero healing opportunities thanks to a constant rhythm of fireballs. Did I mention this boss does double the standard damage with every single attack? The only way to increase your odds of victory is to use a charm build that works well for you, then practice, practice, practice in the Hall of Gods. Even with that opportunity, it still took me over four hours to win a single time. That's comparable to the Code Vein duo in Sigrun, but then you have to consider that beating it like this isn't the true victory. To do that, you need to defeat it in the Pantheon of Hallow Nest, a boss rush with over 40 bosses. That means more practice across fights with variable difficulty, organized toward the end in a combination that is insanely punishing. Making it through all of that gives you a single attempt at a boss that took me four hours to beat a single time. It's unreal. I still can't believe I actually beat it. It was simultaneously satisfying to accomplish and sobering to consider how much time I invested in making it happen, which was over 20 hours. On its own, Absolute Radiance would easily grab a top three spot and vie for number one. With the Pantheon of Hallow Nest in consideration as a requirement for claiming real victory, this is the runaway hardest boss of the decade. But of course, that's just my opinion. What bosses did you have the toughest time with this last decade? While you answer, excuse me while I go take a deep breath and stare existentially at a wall for a while to sort out all the fiendish flashbacks these titans of difficulty gave me during the production of this video. Be sure to check out some of the other videos on the screen and subscribe for more videos to come. And of course, I want to thank you for watching today. Much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.